Between 2006 and 2007, we accompanied five young people in the series Strangers as they started their new lives in Germany. Amir was 16 when he fled his native Togo and applied for political asylum here. Florina came from Mexico as a tour guide during the Soccer World Cup and hoped to stay in Germany. Constantine and his family had left Moscow to settle in Leipzig. Rashin from Iran had found the love of her life in Berlin. And Jung from Guangzhou was working as a chef in a restaurant in the southern German town of Zingen. When his work permit expired, he returned to China and we lost contact with him. We recently paid a visit to all the others to find out how they're doing and to hear what's happened to them in the interim. Love caught Rasheen by surprise. She was happily leading an independent life thanks to her job in Tehran with a French oil company. She had no intention of leaving Iran. But then, while on a business trip abroad, she stopped over in Berlin and met Thomas. They got married and Rasheen moved to the German capital. Love helped soothe her feelings of homesickness and anxiety about what she saw as an uncertain future. Rasheen still lives in Berlin today. I came here for a great love, but that great love is no longer. One day he came home and in just five minutes he told me he wanted to leave. He didn't offer any reasons. He just left. I felt paralyzed at first. I lay in bed for three or four hours and I thought, this can't be, he'll come back. I just don't believe it. He's not the kind of person who would do something like this. I didn't sleep for 48 hours. I couldn't sleep. Rasheen looks at some of the footage we shot back in 2006. I came to Berlin and then I went to a disco to dance. I was never in disco. That was the first time that I had the opportunity to dance. And when I saw him, I knew that that's the person with whom I really like to stay and to get old. When I look at that time, I still believe it was love, a really, really powerful love. But when I look at Thomas's face now, I see so many weaknesses there in this person that I didn't see back then. I wonder how I could have fallen in love with him so simply. He's so different. It's so obvious that we're not suited to each other. On the day they moved into their new apartment, Rasheen was dismayed because hardly anyone came to help. I don't know about other people, but my husband doesn't have so many friends. But I had a lot in Iran. And whenever you need help, they come and uh, they are too eager to help you. Rasheen was eager to learn German. Das Fahrrad, die Ferrada. Since Thomas was still a student, she tried to find a job to support them. But she didn't have much luck. Please have a seat. People couldn't understand me back then. They'd say, what, you left your job, your family and your homeland just for Thomas? How could you do that? And why? No one could understand it. And now when I ask myself that today, it seems just as incomprehensible. Oh, 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 oh. 
Konstantin was a singer in a Russian Jewish choir in Moscow. As a Jew, he felt threatened by the growing anti-Semitism in Russia. His professional chances seemed limited, so he planned to move to Germany with his family. After a long wait, they finally received permission to enter the country. Konstantin wanted to go to Leipzig, the city associated with Johann Sebastian Bach, his great idol. He left Moscow accompanied by his wife, son and mother. It wasn't easy, but Konstantin was optimistic about the future. I'm going to Germany to live, to love and to be loved, to respect people and to be respected, and to realize the full potential of my voice. Nowadays, it makes him sad to look back at his early time in Germany. After arriving in the state of Saxony, the family was put up in temporary quarters. Konstantin dreamt of an engagement in the Leipzig Opera Choir. Full of hope, he went to an audition. You're straining too much. You have a forced vibrato, and that's not acceptable for a German choral sound. Konstantin tried not to be discouraged. He got an offer to direct a youth choir. Then came a huge personal blow. As you see, I'm in a new place. There have been a lot of changes in my life. I wasn't expecting them at all. I couldn't have imagined it, even in my worst nightmare. At the end of May, my wife Diana told me she was in love with another man. That was followed by some very unpleasant weeks. She arrived with this young man. I knew him. He was the piano accompanist at our concert. It was 10.30 at night, and she took our sleeping child out of bed and left. She said, that's it. This family story was a disappointment. That's not the right word, it was a real shock. I was totally shocked. I wasn't prepared for it, for this situation. But thank God I managed to survive it. These days, Konstantin works as a voice teacher at a music school in Baunburg, a hundred kilometers from Leipzig. That means he has to commute several hours every day. I 
I was unfortunately out of work and I got help from the state. The employment agency kept sending me job offers. Then I was invited to interview for a job as a foreign language secretary in an international department. The interview went really well. The department head said that there was so much to do that the person who was there before had gotten sick after 10 days. She said if I didn't have a problem with that, I should come back and start tomorrow. So I went there the next day, did a trial run of three hours, and then I said, I can do this. I want to work. Nowadays, Rasheen is an executive assistant at a large pharmaceutical company in Berlin. Here, she's talking with her boss about some travel expenses. How's your day going? Yeah. Everything okay? Yes, everything's fine. <laughs> Lots to do as usual? Yes, at the end of the year. Everyone wants something. I finished putting together the travel expenses, but I'd like to go through it with you again. Okay. Mm -hmm. This hotel bill. Here is the credit card billing. I've entered it in euros. Now it's all correct. I'm sure it's all correct. You're my right-hand woman. So if you just sign it where it says traveler. Language plays such an important role. If you learn the language properly, you feel much more secure. It boosts your self-confidence. What about the traineeship? We can only have one intern now. Jan is here until the end of April. Okay. So then the position will be free. The exactitude that the Germans have, it's in their language as well. At work I know I'm expected to have the same precision. I want to be just as good and just as clear and precise as the Germans, so I'll be accepted here. In Mexico, Florina always felt discriminated against because of her ethnicity. She comes from the Mixteca region in Oaxaca, in the south of the country. Unemployment is high there, and life is hard. Like most of Mexico's indigenous population, Florina's family is poor. Most people leave their villages to go to the United States or, like Florina and her family, to the capital, Mexico City. Only the elderly, like Florina's aunt, have stayed behind. Florina still lives in Mexico City today. When you filmed me the first time, I wanted to talk, not just with the person, but with the world. I wanted to speak on behalf of my family and the community I grew up in, which has been so marginalized. And I still want to talk about how I think and feel, because my story reflects the many stories of many young people who have to struggle in life. At the age of 14, Florina went to work as a maid. Later, she met a German teacher who arranged for her to go to school and learn German. Back 
in 2006, Florina experienced such racism in Mexico that Germany became the land of her dreams. She got the opportunity to travel to Germany with her teacher Karin as a tour guide during the Soccer World Cup. I am so happy to be going to Germany. I'm taking six to eight hours of German classes a week. I also watch German movies and read in German. I wake up with German words in my head. That's how it is for me at the moment. In my mind, I'm already completely in Germany. That was a time in my life when I felt displaced in my own country. I was searching for an alternative, for a way of leaving Mexico. I had this sense that Germany would take me while I was experiencing difficulty with myself and my country. With all my feelings and the lack of possibilities I thought I had here in Mexico, thinking about Germany was like a dream for me. After overcoming a number of hurdles, Florina managed to make the trip at the last minute. She was part of Karin's team of guides accompanying Mexican fans to the 2006 World Cup in Germany. But Florina had little experience supervising tourists. The fans were demanding and tiring, and once again she experienced racism on the part of her fellow Mexicans. After the World Cup, Florina tried to earn a living as a babysitter in Berlin. She hoped to be able to stay in Germany and went to a counseling center for immigrants. What brought you to Germany initially? I worked here for two weeks during the World Cup. Why didn't you apply for a visa at the German consulate in Mexico before you came? I didn't have time to line everything up. That's why I'm in this quandary now. Realistically speaking, I think once your visitor's stay ends, you'll have to leave the country. I wasn't very well prepared for my stay in Germany because I didn't know what I'd be able to do there. I just wanted to leave my country. That was the only thing that was important for me. Actually, I didn't know very much about Germany or how I could live there. Maybe it was foolish of me just to seize the moment like I did. I basically didn't have a chance. During the difficult time after his separation, Konstantin found strength in the Russian Orthodox religion. Although he comes from a Jewish family, he felt supported by the congregation at Leipzig's Russian Memorial Church. The thing that helped me through this terrible family situation, this drama, was the feeling I wasn't all alone. 
I don't mean just my mother and the other people who helped me, but that God was and is with me, and He knows where He is leading me. Maybe that's what helped me avoid the worst effects. I sense that people without religious faith feel a great emptiness. There's something significant missing in their souls. After my marriage broke up, people would always ask me, what are you going to do now? Will you stay in Berlin? And I thought, what a stupid question. This is my city. My life is here. My work is here. Where else would I go? There was no question of returning to Iran. That's not an option for me. The hardest part was telling my family. It took me 10 days before I made the decision to write a letter explaining everything to my mother and telling her not to be so sad, that what had happened was a good thing. Of course, society doesn't consider failed marriage as good. It's supposed to be a sad thing, and in my culture it's even less accepted than in Germany. Let yourself fall into the floor, connect to the floor, let it carry you. I did a lot of yoga. I meditated and talked to a therapist. And quite soon I realized that I actually felt pretty good about it. I was content, felt fine, but that made me feel guilty. I thought, my God, how can I feel good when my husband has left me? I don't feel lonely at all, just the opposite. I have the feeling that I'm really starting to find myself in my new life in this wonderful city. And somehow I am so grateful for this separation. It was a big step in my life. It's like I've put on a different pair of glasses. I used to wear pessimistic glasses. I was never happy. Everyone could see that. I'm very content. Well, maybe content is the wrong word. I'm very happy that I found my other half here in Germany. After the tough and trying times, I met a wonderful young woman, Elena. We've been together for three and a half years. I'm happy, and I hope she is too. We have a son. 
David. He's two and a half, and that is also marvelous. There are a lot of beautiful things in my life. <laughs> After David was born, the family moved into a three-room apartment on the outskirts of Leipzig. Konstantin's wife, Elena, is a physiotherapist. She also comes from the former Soviet Union. They speak Russian at home. Konstantin's son from his previous marriage, eight-year-old Evgeny, visits only rarely. <laughs> I see my older son twice a month. That's not nearly enough. I really miss being with him. My son is my greatest source of worry and my sorrow. I'm very anxious about him. At the moment, he's having health problems. And I try to help out as much as I can. Amir was 16 when he arrived in Munich from Togo with forged documents. He was facing reprisals because he had taken part in anti-government protests. My name is Idrisu Traoré Amir. I was born on November 15, 1989 in Sokodé. I'm an ethnic Kotokoli. There was a problem that made me leave my country. In Bavaria, Amir was housed in an orphanage, along with other underage refugees. He integrated quickly into German society and finished secondary school with good marks. His court-appointed guardian, Albert, was proud of his achievements. Amir started an apprenticeship at a Munich bakery. Everything was going well, but then Albert received a notification. Take a seat over there. Amir, I asked you here because the letter from the Federal Office for Migration and Refugees has arrived. I'll tell you what it says. We've been waiting a long time. The Federal Office has turned down your application for asylum. It says you have to return to Togo. I have appealed against the decision. We'll take it to court. And they will go over the whole asylum process again. Until then, everything will stay the way it is. You'll go on living in the orphanage, and you'll finish your training. Point four here says that you have to return to Togo, and that if you don't, you'll be deported. Do you know what deported means? It means the police will take you back to Togo. I see that it was not easy for me. 
Compared to now, I was under a lot of strain back then. It just never stopped. I couldn't sleep. When you're always worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow, it really wasn't easy. I still think about the day Albert told me the decision. That was really... I was crushed. I didn't want to go back. I called my brother and told him about it. I said, what should I do now? The best thing would be just to die. When I got back to Mexico from Germany, I tried to find work. The only alternative I saw was to work in tourism. I had started learning German, and I thought I could make a living from that. At the end of her training course as a tourist guide, Florina wrote her final paper about the artworks created by Maya women weavers in the southern state of Chiapas. So sheep are sacred for the people here in the highlands. When they shear the sheep, they say a prayer and give them a little salt to compensate for taking away their wool. Yes, the people who have sheep always say prayers. They light candles or incense to ask for many sheep so we can make our textiles and live from them. What do these patterns mean? Those are frogs. Sometimes there are figures that represent the creation of the universe or the world of the Maya and their traditions, aren't there? Well, people say that this one in particular brings good luck. Is it the oldest pattern? Yes, and these are butterflies. It takes us three months to make this. Three months? Yes, three months to make it. Working the whole day? Yes, the whole day and into the night. In Chiapas, Florina also encountered the Zapatistas, the rebel movement that, since an uprising in 1994, has been fighting for more rights for the indigenous population. Nowadays, the Zapatistas use political activism to campaign for autonomy and more control of resources. We're concerned about the lack of democracy, justice and freedom in this world. So we say we must not exchange our strength for weakness. I see the Zapatistas as a great model for my country, for Latin America and for the world. They have managed to get the indigenous peoples to recognize their own culture and human values. To see these people close up who are fighting for their culture, their history, and their own lives, that impressed me a lot. This feeling of struggle, of advancing and not just accepting what people hand you, is a source of strength. This is a great example to me. It has given me a lot of strength in my own life.
Once I went to a political event organized by the Christian Democrats, there was a woman there who started stirring up conflict. She started attacking me. I found out later that she was the head of a neo-Nazi party's youth organization. Straight away she asked me, why are you here? You're not a German citizen. This won't interest you. I told her, I live here in Germany and I want to become a German citizen. If I could have done so earlier, I would have. But a Jewish immigrant from Russia has to wait eight years to get citizenship. Then she said, everyone is welcome here except Jews. That really shocked me. Konstantin conducts the Slavia Choir in Leipzig. Its repertoire consists mainly of Russian songs. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Да, 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 вот такой русский, да. Накрывайте столы, да все полы мамы радуйся, ой радуйся земле, развеселый Божий сын народился. The last time I was in Moscow was two years ago. Und als ich dann zurück nach Deutschland. And when I returned to Germany. I felt like I was flying home. I feel good here in Germany now. Amir has a visitor today, his former guardian, Albert. Albert did a great deal to help Amir. In 2006, he flew to Togo to find out how credible Amir's claims were. He hoped to testify on Amir's behalf at the forthcoming court date. And he spoke to Amir's family to corroborate the reasons he fled Togo. Even so, Amir's asylum application was rejected. But thanks to the activism of people like Albert and refugee groups, the law was changed in 2008. After that, applicants who had vocational training and a job were permitted to stay. After he completed his baker's training, Amir was the first refugee in Bavaria to be granted a residence permit based on the new law. Life is not easy. You have to keep struggling. I did. I really kept on. And in the end, it was worth it. Back then, Albert was like a father to me. Just like a father with his son. He gave me courage. He'd say, Amir, keep going. And I did. And in the end, we reached our goal. I'm happy, and he was glad to. How are you, man? Good, thanks. I'm glad to see you. It's been a long time. I'm glad to see you again, too. I'm really glad that I gave it everything I had. I look back at how things were for me then, and how they are now, and it makes me really happy. I'm thankful that all the people here and at home supported me. And if this is the result, it's a wonderful thing, really. Amir's current residence permit expires in 2014. After that, he hopes he'll be granted unlimited permission to stay. While I was working in Chiapas, a colleague called and told me about an opportunity to study at the university. 
It basically just fell from the sky. I never, ever expected to receive a phone call saying there was a way I could study. I had worked for a while as a messenger, and I always used to pass by that university. It's in a really lovely area. Everything there is expensive. I loved that university, and I'd ask myself, who gets to study here? I would love to study here. It was just one of those silly things that go through your head without even thinking. Florina was awarded a scholarship for indigenous students at the elite Ibero-American University. It's a private university, one of the most expensive colleges in Mexico. It's simply incredible that I'm here now. Normally only people with lots of money can study here. I have always seen education as a way of getting ahead. My family's economic situation was very bad. I've had to work ever since I was young. I started at the bottom, cleaning for people, and I always wished for other opportunities. We'll find out more about what's happened to Florina, Constantine, Rashin, and Amir in part two of Strangers.